series works. The government of India, government of the Swami Pollution in the year 2009 and 14 from the Department of Biotechnology, government of India. And uh, he has got the National Biotech Support for this cabinet development. He has got different papers, he has published different papers in well reported and peer reviewed journals, and especially in nature, in cell, in aging, in nature genetics, as well as a pure course. Such a wonderful person, Mr. to share his expertise. Just get enlightened. Enrich yourself by his speech. Thank you once again. Over to you, Thank you. Am I am I audible to everybody? Yes, sir. And my screen is visible. Yes, sir. Okay, so uh, thank you very much uh, for the kind introduction. A very good morning to everybody. And uh, so I'm really, really grateful uh, to be invited for this uh, uh, wonderful symposium. Uh, and also congratulate your department on completing this 50 glorious years of existence. So, uh, Rhyming with the, you know, the, the uh, sentiment of this uh, particular symposium, today I'm going to talk about how we use uh, a model organism, which is called Synorhabditis elegans, to understand the basic measure uh, me mechanisms of longevity aspects. And as uh, uh, particularly thank Benjamin for inviting me, and uh, and and uh, I'll. I'll briefly tell you about the institute that I work in. It's called the National Institute of Immunology. It's a premier institute of the Department of Biotechnology, one of the oldest ones, uh, and, and predates actually uh, DBT. And uh, uh, we have research programs uh, in immunology, infectious disease biology, uh, you know, many other aspects of uh, cancer biology, non-communicable diseases. And uh, we are 40 years old. and uh, some of the greatest contributions uh, from our university, uh, from our institute, has been the anti-leprosy vaccine and anti-cancer uh, immunotherapeutics and dendritic cell vaccines. So, before I start, I would like to acknowledge some of the members uh, who have contributed immensely towards the development of the program in my laboratory, as well as my collaborators, uh, funding agencies. Uh, and support from my from my institute and many uh, photographs and resources that I'm going to present to you today comes from the internet. So thanks to internet. Uh, so today I have divided my talk into four different aspects. So we're going to talk about why we study aging, uh, how we study aging, and uh, the big question you might be wondering: uh, Can we delay aging by any means? And uh, and then lastly, and uh, probably very briefly, I'm going to talk about what we are going to what, what we are doing in our laboratory in order to address uh, some of the burning questions in the field. So let us start by defining the process of aging. To me, as a scientist, uh, aging is nothing but a phenotype. Uh, you know, you, you have heard about phenotypes in your, uh, in, your, in, your, in your lectures, and you have talked about uh, Drosophila phenotypes that you can follow. You have phenotypes uh, uh, which you use to study developmental biology. So for me, uh, aging is a phenotype in developmental biology, which I try to understand various uh, processes uh, of signal transduction, of gene expression, and metabolism. So in order to use this phenotype in science, uh, you need to be able to define it. And that has been a major problem because it's, it's such a stochastic event, uh, although it's so conserved uh, in, in evolution and in nature, 
uh, defining it is a is a is a quite a trick. So over over the years, many scientists have uh, put in their uh, wisdom behind defining aging, and uh, we uh, typically now understand that it can be defined uh, by an exponential increase in mortality, uh, physiological changes uh, that lead to functional decline and increased susceptibility to certain diseases of age. And I would like you to remember the last point because uh, a lot uh, a lot, uh, lot of uh, effort is being tried, has been uh, put forward to delay uh, the onset of aging. So apparently, if you look at many organisms in nature, you would not see them aging as such. However, I can assure you that uh, their internal organs do age. So probably you are not looking at uh, chronological, uh, you're looking at chronological aging, but phenotypic aging is missing in these uh, organisms like tortoise, lobster, and raphite rockfish. So the big question that we ask, and you, were, you might be wondering in your mind currently, is why do we study aging? Uh, is it for eternal life? Uh, Yes, some of us do uh, want to uh, live forever, and this is not new. Uh, uh, for time immemorial, uh, human beings have aspired to live for eternity, and this is a beautiful uh, uh, this is a beautiful illustration by Lucas Cronach, the Elder, uh, in the 16th century, which where he visualized the fountain of youth, and uh, you can see that uh, people coming in having uh, taken a bath, is completely rejuvenated, and goes on to enjoy life. However, this is a distant dream currently, uh, because we lack uh, many of the important uh, uh, understanding blocks in this process. However, if you plan to live forever, you do not want to make the Tithonus error. So you must have heard about Tithonus error in your literature classes. And uh, as the saying goes in Greek mythology, Yos, who was uh, uh, the daughter of uh, Zeus, fell in love with Tithonus and uh, begged for his immortality to his ever uh, powerful you know, father Zeus. And Zeus uh, made Tithonus immortal. However, Yos forgot to ask for eternal youth. And as uh, Lord Tennyson, and it's a ballad by Lawton, so writes that uh, Tithonus was smart and wasted with time. And finally, he was so sick that uh, Yos took pity on him and turned uh, him into a grasshopper. So what I'm getting at uh, by this, uh, this information is that the length of life is not important. It is a quality of life. So if you have to live up to 100 years of age, you would rather have 99 years of very healthy life and then suddenly die. And this is not uh, unheard of in nature. And one of the greatest examples is that of Alaskan salmon, which uh, live for uh, one to three years uh, in the place where it's, it hatches and then spends up to eight years in the sea. And then it comes back to the same spawning area where it was born and goes upstream and quickly ages within a span of two weeks and dies. So essentially living a very, very healthy life throughout its lifespan and quickly dying at the end. And this kind of uh, you know, enviable life is also there in many centenarians, as you can see from this uh, internet resource, we made the eight-year-old model from China, or this uh, 96-year-old runner, 108, 102 years old runner from US and UK. So essentially, uh, we, as we age, and everybody will age, right? So we are more worried about, uh, about the sunset years of our life because they're is a various connection between aging and disease. So as you grow older, your immunity, your metabolic activity, your 
proliferative potential of your tissues and cells, they decline. And as a result, all the cells of your body, your tissues and organs start uh, malfunctioning. And this leads to aging. And as you can see from this uh, US data from NIH, <clears throat> The incidences of age-related diseases like Alzheimer's disease, type 2 diabetes, cancer, heart disease, they increase exponentially as human beings become older and older. And that means that as you grow older, the chances of debilitating diseases increase uh, exponentially. And that is a matter of great concern. You know, even in uh, countries, young countries like India, because as you will appreciate that the life expectancy of human beings living in India have increased from 35 years in 1950 to 68 years as of current 2015. So what does it mean? It means that the world is getting older and older in terms of the demography. So it is predicted that by the year 2050, 21% of the world population will be over the age of 60 years. And what does it mean? It means uh, in a country, young country like India, where the majority of the population demography is young, many people will turn 60 at the same time. And that is a huge worry uh, if that population is not healthy. And if you look at uh, the per capita cost of keeping an individual who is growing older healthy is tremendous because as you grow older, the per capita cost, and this is, this is a US data again, increases several, several folds. And for a country, <clears throat> for a, you know, most importantly for uh, countries where there are uh, social securities and, and great healthcare, uh, system uh, which is free, this uh, cost becomes a burden on the economy. If you if you ask me that for a country like India, what does it cost? It costs several fold more because as you grow older and your population is not healthy, you lose a lot of a uh, lot of resources in terms of uh, you know. Uh, effective uh, and productive population. So as, as you grow older, less number of people will become productive. So there is an enormous amount of uh, uh, requirement in keeping the aging society healthy. And that's one of the reasons why uh, you would like to delay the process of aging. So in order to delay the process of aging, you would require to understand the molecular mechanisms or the fundamental biology behind this process. And I would like to summarize almost five decades of research that has shown uh, some of the reasons why uh, we age over, you know, in, uh, as time passes by. And I wish I could simply show you everything uh, that is known. However, a concise uh, representation of the hallmarks of aging was put forward in 2013 and it is going to be renewed this year and you will soon see a paper in cell about it and these are hallmarks of aging that what the, the the processes which really fall apart as you become older and older and that is genomic instability telomere attrition alterations in your epigenome loss of protein folding and uh, degradation machinery deregulated insulin uh, nutrient sensing, uh, mitochondrial dysfunction, cellular senescence, stem cell exhaustion, and altered intracellular communication. And the ones which are circled in red are the ones my lab is interested in. So briefly, let us go through why, what are the causes of aging? One of the key causes of aging is uh, loss of chromosome ends or you know, or chromosome attrition. And this happens uh, uh, as the cells keep on dividing, they lose uh, the ends of their chromosome. And this you will learn in your 
uh, in your biology lectures. And soon they reach replicative sensors. They cannot divide anymore. So if you're wondering how that affects aging, so your cells are replenished by stem cells. And if the stem cells stop uh, replicating because of replicative aging, then there will be no repair in the body and the body will start aging sooner than later. And, and this uh, gave Nobel Prize to Black, uh, Blackburn, Rinder and Shostak in 2009, this discovery. The other interesting thing that happens as you age is loss of muscle function. And one of the reasons for that is increased mitochondrial dysfunction. So if you look at a very uh, young cell, you'll see the beautiful network of mitochondria. However, when you compare this with an old cell, the mitochondria is fragmented and fragmented mitochondria cannot carry on metabolism uh, well and produce enough ATP. Instead, they start producing a lot of reactive oxygen species. And this looks very similar to mitochondria that has been treated with uh, reactive oxygen species like hydrogen peroxide. So essentially, as you grow old, your mitochondria fragments and cracks up and is no more able to sustain the resources required to maintain a healthy musculature. And as, as a result, one of the reasons why you uh, end up having sarcopenia as you grow old. I, I was talking about stem cell a few slides back. These stem cells are the key resources uh, to maintain uh, healthy tissues. And as you grow older, they are exposed to many insults of the nature, like x-rays, oxidative stress, uh, UV, and they also uh, lose their telomere because of uh, you know, repeated division. And this leads to DNA damage, and this DNA damage could lead to inactivating mutations that can, cause, uh, that can cause cancer or could activate checkpoints uh, in the cell cycle and lead to senescence or apoptosis. And this accumulation of stem cells, which are senescent, leads to aging. Finally, uh, as you grow older, there is something which is uh, in scientific terms called proteostatic collapse or the inability of your cells to fold or degrade misfolded proteins. And this is leading cause of many neurodegenerative diseases that you might have heard of. Just like uh, increased misfolding and aggregation of alpha nucleus could lead to Parkinson's disease. On the other hand, increased protein production uh, would lead to familial Alzheimer's disease or increased degradation of, say, CFTR leads to cystic fibrosis. So it is essential that as uh, in, in young age, while there is a delicate balance maintained between recycling and functionalization of protein and synthesis and functionalization of protein, this balance uh, is lost as you go older. So the ultimate idea, uh, which was, you know, uh, put forward by Dr. Patridge a long time ago, is that instead of therapeutically intervening into individual diseases of aging, like atherosclerosis, neurodegeneration, cancer, disease, you intervene therapeutically in the aging process and delay this process as a whole, and as a result, delay the onset of these age-related diseases. So aging is a complex phenotype. It's a multi, uh, multigenic phenotype, highly pleiotropic, and it, lead, and it needs very robust model systems to study. Uh, some of the model systems that has been historically used in studying aging has been EAST, the single cell eukaryote, Synodaptitis elegans, Drosophila, mouse, and more recently, uh, the African killifish, which is now the hot favorite model of vertebrate aging. Um, in around 1970s, uh, this great scientist, Sidney Brenner, 
realized the importance of model systems in, stu in studying modern biology. And he realized that biochemistry, uh, a breakdown of biochemistry, which was so uh, uh, popular at that time, would not be able to deliver the kind of understanding uh, at systems level that we need in order to uh, you know, uh, find out the causes of disease or, or causes of uh, how nature uh, works. So he introduced to us a beautiful model system, which is called this generative this elegance. Now, you can see that uh, on your screen right now, it's a, it's a, it's a small nematode only one millimeter in length, but is a power packed genetic system. The main advantage of using C. elegans as a model is that it has a short lifespan, which is very important for aging research. In contrast, a mouse would have a lifespan of up to two years, and, and it's, it's a not a favorable uh, model system. So C. elegans on average would leave at around uh, 17 to 18 days average lifespan and maximum lifespan of 23 to 25 days. It's very cheap to maintain and uh, it's a model that is used uh, even in uh, undergrad colleges and schools. It is very easy to store. If you are not using the model currently, then you can just simply freeze it and put it at uh, uh, minus 80 degrees. It has very high fecundity. It can lay up to 300 eggs. It's absolutely transparent. And so you can see through uh, all the organs that it has. It is backed by powerful genetics and amenable to high throughput techniques of uh, modern biology. And so these uh, essential att attributes also balances an important uh, point. That is, it is extremely relevant to human research. And everything that we study using C. elegans is in vivo. It gives us a whole organism perspective of biology. So uh, I'm going to show you some uh, uh, internet resources on how C. elegans is used. It can be used to study very early cell division, as you can see, uh, because it's transparent. You can do a time-lapse imaging under a microscope, uh, uh, a light microscope, and uh, and, and see how the cells divide. You can map these cells. In fact, we know exactly how cell division takes place uh, and in uh, what time frame and everything about the cell lineages. You can also look at uh, the temporal as well as spatial distribution of genes during cell division by, uh, for example, in this uh, video, you will see, uh, you will see that uh, the histones are labeled with different colors, and you can, uh, in 3D, look at how cell division is taking place. You can have a little fun with the with these organisms by dropping some chemoattractants on the plate, and you see these worms soon align themselves uh, and and start aggregating at places where they can sense that chemical, and this is the basis for the field of neurobiology using C. elegans as a model system. And we know a lot about what neurons and genes regulate this process. You can also study gene function by knocking down or knocking out genes. For example, in this, you can use RNA interference to knock down the PAR2 gene. And as you can see, as opposed to the control, these, animal, uh, these eggs are not as a replication proficient as the, the other ones. So you can use this model very nicely to study the molecular basis of aging. And the reason for this is that it behaves exactly like other eukaryotic organisms. So as you can see, this is a one day old uh, animal and it, has, uh, it can move around without any prodding. It, uh, uh, on the other hand, an eight day old organism is healthy but it takes a little prodding for it to move. However, on 23rd day, this organism is probably dead. So by simply looking at a plate with, uh, uh, with different aged organism, uh, and by simply touching them with a platinum loop or a, or, or, or a, or a, or a hair, uh, you can 
decide whether the worm is alive or living. And if you now plot the mortality of these worms as uh, against time on the x-axis, you get this beautiful uh, lifespan graph. And very interestingly, this lifespan graph will look exactly the same whether you're using yeast, whether you're using C. elegans, Drosophila, or even human. So lifespan is a great measure of aging in a population. So the next question that, uh, uh, can somebody please mute their uh, Zoom? So uh, the, the big question in the field is, can we delay aging? So the first thing that I'm going to tell you about uh, aging is that aging is controlled both by genes and by environment. And what I mean by that is, uh, Way back uh, in the mid uh, last century, it was found that single gene mutations can accelerate the rate of age. And the classical examples that uh, you would see in literature is Warner syndrome, where you see a patient uh, at 15 years of age has uh, accelerated aging and by 48 years, she looks uh, more than eight years old. On the other hand, uh, in a, a single uh, mutation in the lamina gene leads to accelerated aging. And these are actually kids uh, less than 10 years of age uh, who look very, very old. So these told scientists very early on that, uh, that aging is controlled by genes. Uh, a very interesting example of how single gene mutations can uh, delay aging was uh, shown almost back in 1993 by the lab of Cynthia Kenyon, where they showed that a point mutation in the insulin IGF receptor, which lowers the signaling through this pathway, leads to, leads to animals which are very, very young, even at day 20. And I told you that the maximum lifespan of C. elegans is 23 to 25 days. While these animals on day 20 are barely alive, they're hardly moving. On the other hand, these animals, which has a single point mutation in their insulin IGF receptor, um, can move freely and they end up living two and a half times longer than their wild type counterpart. And if you plot this on a, on a graph, this is how, looks, uh, how it looks like by, by knocking down the insulin receptor uh, and then lowering the signaling through this pathway, you can dramatically increase lifespan. Not only in C. elegans, it was also shown to be the case in flies as well as in mice. And if you are wondering that how come insulin signaling, which is deregulated in diabetes, uh, is causing increase in longevity in, uh, in these species, uh, I would like to remind you uh, that deregulation is different from lowering of insulin signaling. So by lowering, you can, you can lower your insulin signaling by eating less. On, on the other hand, uh, overeating will deregulate your insulin signaling. So the fact that insulin signaling uh, regulates aging became uh, widely known uh, after the 1993 experiment from Cynthia Kenyon's lab. And this makes sense. Uh, because if you, if you look, and as I told you, that you can lower your insulin signaling by simply eating less, uh, if you look at the long-lived population all throughout the world, uh, uh, like in Loma Linda, in Okinawa, Sardinia, one of the things that these people do right is eat wisely. And this has been documented very nicely by, by Dan Butner, uh, who is a National Geographic uh, explorer, uh, and, and, uh, and has documented the lives of these long-lived people and found, uh, and, and so has uh, uh, this book, a uh, very interesting book which you should all read, which is called Ikigai, that eating wisely uh, is one of the main reasons why these people are living longer. And this, 
this essentially lowers their uh, insulin signaling pathway. So if you, if you scientifically think about uh, how environment influences longevity uh, by modulating these genes, we have for many, many years now know that if you, if you have to live long, you have to lower your food intake by lowering uh, and or, or lower the mTOR signaling, amplify the AMPK signaling, amplify the, the sirtuins, and lower the insulin signaling, as I just mentioned. And many of this research has been spearheaded by C. elegans biologists. So effectively, what I told you is that the longevity of an organism is a complex process and it's regulated by genes and also by environment, most essentially by the amount of food or the quality of nutrients that you are uh, eating. So if you look at, the, uh, the, look at it in the other way, you can see that when uh, you grow fatter, you're obese or you're overweight, uh, many of the processes, many of the diseases of age um, uh, come up early in lifespan. For example, uh, obese people often develop hypertension, stroke, coronary heart diseases, cancer, diabetes, very early in life, even in their late uh, 20s and early 30s. And as a country, which is really, really fat, India has to worry about uh, obesity in general and, and the epidemic of diabetes resulting from it. And this tells that in, by uh, eating more, having more access to nutrition, the world uh, in general and India specifically is aging at a much faster rate. The silver lining is that if you simply withhold the amount of energy that, or reduce the amount of energy that you take in every day through a process which is called dietary restriction, you can lower all kinds of age-related mortalities and morbidities uh, in every, almost every higher organism that has been tested be it yeast, uh, be it uh, drosophila, be it C. elegans, uh, mice, even in human. So by restricting the nutrition or the calories in your diet, you can live a long, healthy life. And this is a great example from two studies uh, which, uh, uh, which are being conducted for over 20 years in non-human primates. Uh, monkeys, which are uh, fed low calorie diet com are much younger and have lesser age related diseases compared to monkeys who have been fed uh, over 20 years with high calorie diet equivalent uh, to what we eat in everyday life. So uh, if you are not interested in reducing the amount of food uh, or the number of calories that you're intake, uh, taking in every day, a simple intervention, which has uh, you know, become uh, a society fad right now, is called intermittent fasting, uh, which was initially you know, scientifically proven to be very effective by Walter Longo of University of South, Southern California and, uh, and Sachin Ananda Panda from uh, Salk Institute. Uh, they, they show that uh, if you eat for only eight hours a day and remain fasted, uh, uh, for the re remaining 16 hours, you can get all the benefits of dietary restriction. And, and that includes you know, from a, a weight loss, a boosting of immune system, improve glucose tolerance, and you know, decreasing your ch chances of getting diabetes as you grow older. So let me summarize till now what I've told you. Uh, I've told you that all, organism, all, all organisms age, and uh, it is important uh, to, uh, to, to have eternal health while you live your life rather than aspiring for eternal life, which is a uh, uh, you know, long way down, uh, down the, you know, the, the journey. Uh, it is, we're told why it is important to study aging. It is to delay age-related diseases. We've talked about some of the causes of aging introduced to the model system, C. elegans and uh, I've also told you that aging is controlled by gene as well as your nutrition and that you can extend both lifespan and health span by simple dietary interventions 
or you know decreasing the amount of food or the type of food or or or, or reducing the calories in your diet so now i'm going to just briefly over the next uh, few minutes tell you that what we are interested in understanding in our life in in our uh, lab and of, of course in our life uh, so the fundamental question that we are asking is how does an organism interact with its diet to modulate lifespan and this is this is very important to understand uh, if we want to translate our uh, our knowledge about aging uh, into into everyday life so over last several years and, and you really don't have to go into the details of it what we have found through our research is that uh, organism like c elegans and i'm sure about um, that this is going to be the case with higher organism um, have modules which sense food quantity and food quality and has very extensive uh, genetic network or signal transduction network which leads uh, to changes in metabolism and uh, that relates to activation of cytoprotective genes which uh, detoxify the body and increase longevity on the other hand there is another module which is which intensely cross talks between uh, with the food quantity determining module that determines the quality of food and responds almost very similar uh, uh, to the to this other module and that that has essentially many of the components which are shared we do not understand how they cross talk at the, as, as, at this point but that is our long term goal so i'm going to talk briefly about how these organisms use uh, the second module uh, which is this food quality module to understand what kind of food they are eating and accordingly uh, accordingly modulate longevity so you have to understand one very simple thing is that for a for an animal in the wild living long is not important it is important to ensure that their progeny survive so their main lookout is to how to have their gene pool transmitted to the next generation and to the generation after that it is humans who are aspiring to living live long life but that's not the case in the wild so you know by understanding how the wild animals would regulate their rate of aging we can uh, we can tweak a human diet or human genes much later of course Uh, in order to have long healthy lifespan so way back uh, when sonia verma was a phd student in my lab uh, uh, and now she is a faculty in uh, cdri lucknow she started trying to understand how diet and genes pair up with each other and and this is important to understand uh, go back to the last slide because uh, uh, one thing that you have to remember is that uh c elegans is a bacterial pore in the sense that they eat bacteria uh so you can simply grow them on a lawn containing bacteria and they will be happy now you can grow them on different kind of bacteria and each each strain of bacteria have different quantities of carbohydrate uh vitamins fat uh, and and they differ from each other in their lps structure so these worms have developed Uh, a lot of uh, you know controlling mechanisms in order to sense what kind of bacteria they are use uh, eating and they can choose between different kind of bacteria so in, in the in the lab we typically use two equalized strains one is op50 and one is hd105 so under normal condition the worms do not care they would eat any of these and they are able to maintain normal lifespan however if one some of the genes uh, in this pathway Uh, which we call FLR4 is mutated. Uh, these worms now start preferring the HT115 bacteria and activate a signal transduction pathway le leading to protective gene expression, and then these worms start living longer. So Sonia started getting interested in this project in uh, in 2016 or so, 
and and she she saw that when this FLR4 mutant worms have grown on HT105, the extraordinary uh, long lifespan compared to you know the same mutant grown on OP15. So that's why we put you know fairy and a devil here, although in the wild it would be the other way around. And this you know this interaction between diet and genes is called diet gene interaction. So in order to understand what is going on, we did an RNA-seq analysis and we found that uh, genes which are involved in a very conserved metabolic pathway, which is called one carbon metabolism, are upregulated only when these mutants are fed, this HT115 bacteria. And so what is one carbon metabolism? One carbon metabolism is a very conserved pathway, as I mentioned, and is a pathway which requires the vitamin B12 uh, as a cofactor for its enzyme. And these are the only two enzymes which require B12 uh, in your body. And that's how that's why you know you need to eat uh, fruits and vegetables having high B12. And also when you are sick, the doctors prescribe you vitamin B12. So what we found out is that uh, these worms. Uh, uh, these bugs, which are the bacteria, have different concentrations of vitamin B12. And so when, they are, when the mutant is eating high B12 containing diet, these worms live longer. On the other hand, on low B12 containing diet, the, these mutant worms cannot live longer. So this project was you know, taken forward by another graduate student who recently uh, uh, went for a postdoc in University of Southern California. And she showed that these bacteria have high B12 and this bacteria has low B12. And that we may measured quantitatively uh, using very sophisticated techniques. And if you now take the low bacteria, the low B12 containing bacteria and uh, dump a lot of B12 in the media, these bacteria can now pick up that B12 and have a large amount of B12 in their, in their body. So now I would like to remind you that similar to C. elegans, uh, our, uh, we also cannot make B12 and entirely depend on food or the bacteria E. coli residing inside our body, uh, not E. coli, other bacteria residing in our body to make B12 for us. And that's how we get B12. So C. elegans and humans almost have very similar mechanisms of B12 uptake. So what she finally showed is that if you now take the OP50 bacteria, which you know you gives shorter lifespan and add B12 to it, and as I told you that this bacteria can now pick up the B12 from the media and present it to the mutant, the mutant starts living as long as, the, as, as if it is growing on the high B12 containing diet. So you know we did a lot of other experiments and finally came up uh, with this model where we showed how this gene regulates a complex network of uh, metabolic genes as well as genes involved in cytoprotection in order to maintain normal lifespan in these uh, C. elegans in the wild. So as I told you that in the wild, these animals do not want to have very long lifespan because very often long lifespan is associated with uh, less number of egg pro produced by that organism. Because as you can understand, if there's a lot of energy required to make eggs, and if uh, an organism has to live long, it has to invest the same energy in somatic maintenance, maintaining its somatic tissues in a healthy manner. And as a result, would end up laying less number of eggs, which is not of any evolutionary advantage to a wild animal. So now we are taking this forward uh, with the PhD project of another graduate student to understand how the intestine where this vitamin B12 is taken up and then systemically distributed throughout the body interacts with neurons in order to maintain healthy longevity. So you can understand that while the gut or the, in the intestine is where the vitamin B12 is uh, taken out by the body, but longevity maintenance happens in every tissue. So how does gut and the neuron cross talk in maintaining 
healthy lifespan. And this is this is something which we have uh, sort of teased out genetically and at the molecular details. And we show that serotonin, which is a neurotransmitter released by the neurons, is taken up by receptors in the gut membrane. And this leads to activation of a signal transduction pathway, which leads to a systemic uh, information spread that, the, that every organ has to uh, go into maintenance rather than aging. And as a result, in general, this worms live a long, long time. So let me take, you know, end here and uh, remind you of what I have told you today. I've told you that aging can be delayed and health span can be increased. And for that, you have to eat less and for less duration during, to, in order to live long. And that C. elegans is a wonderful model system to study aging in, uh, uh, in aging and biology in general. Uh, I've shown you that micronutrients regulate aging. So it is important that we have a balanced diet. And in the wild, the animals prefer not to live long because reproductive cost is unacceptable to evolution. So with that, I thank again uh, all of you for giving me this opportunity uh, and again congratulate you on achieving this important milestone of uh, 50 years of your department.